Hey gang, we are in Jamaica Plain today in the south area of Boston, Boston, Massachusetts, and we're at Forest Hill Cemetery. Pretty big and epic place here, a lot of stories. But the story we're going to talk about today is of this mystic woman who went by the moniker, or call it a stage name, of Marjorie. Well, she was a spiritualist. She did seances, and in the Gilded Age through the Roaring Twenties, she was she was one of the big heavyweights in this field now and heavyweight fighter she was really knocking heads with Harry Houdini we're gonna connect some dots here remember the episode on Houdini we went to his grave he was a debunker and then on the other side of the coin you have people like Arthur Conan Doyle who wrote Sherlock Holmes he was a big embracer of this and he would just do anything say anything to like fight with Houdini and then we also did that trilogy of Aleister Crowley and Evangelina Adams and all of that. So that all kind of orbits into this story. They all probably knew each other and they would work with these elite families going back to like Devil in the White City. There's so many connections. So let's take a walk to her grave and I'll tell you the story. Now this cemetery is so large you could spend not just a year but probably several years trying to cover a lot of the history that's here and some of the most dramatic stones that I've I've seen so let's let's start back in 1890 there's a girl born her name was Mina Marguerite Stinson on June 2nd of 1890 and it was on a farm near Picton, Ontario, up in Canada. And that's where she grew up. She moved to Boston here as she was a young woman and she began working as a secretary at a local church. And this is where she met and married a man named Earl Rand. Earl Rand was a grocer and they would have one son together and everything was going great. But at some point she got ill, very ill. And they thought it, it might have been appendicitis. I mean, that was that's still dangerous today. And she had, of course, go to the hospital. And it was here that she would meet her future husband, a surgeon named Dr. Leroy Goddard Crandon. And the Crandon name is kind of a famous, kind of a famous name. Some of you may have heard of. Of course, he was her surgeon. Now, this guy was described as a pretty arrogant guy. He was unpleasant, antisocial. And, you know, he was doing pretty well. He was in the upper crust. Now, they didn't, nothing really happened. I mean, it was just kind of where they first ran into each other, where they first met, but they would somehow meet up again later that year. And the somehow was that they were both serving in the same branch of the army. Now, Crandon was a lieutenant commander and head of surgical staff in a New England naval hospital during World War I. At the same time, Mina was a civilian volunteer ambulance driver. At the same time, Mina was a civilian. Now, they seemed to have a thing for each other. And of course, rekindling, it was probably love at first sight. And they're like, hey, this is probably meant to be. So we need to do something about this, right? And so it would be. Next thing you know, Mina sues for divorce from Earl, January of 1918, and she becomes pretty quickly Crandon's third wife. Just a few months later, actually. Mina starts to become fascinated with seances. And she takes it up as a hobby. And she seemed to be pretty good at it. She was a natural. 
In June of 1924, she got her name submitted to this contest. It was a contest that was being offered by Scientific American Magazine, the big magazine of the time for that. When they put up this contest, they offered any medium that could demonstrate telekinetic ability under a scientifically controlled area, they would win a couple of thousand dollars. Actually, I think it was 2,500 bucks. She's in, she enters. And you know what? I've got a doctor as a husband. I can really prepare for this challenge. We can really figure this out. I want to win this. Now, she really didn't care about the money, you know, if they were loaded. And she had great charm. So the public saw it as, wow, she must be the real thing. Don't care about the money, and of course she was very confident. And she was like a magnet, so this is how she gained her initial fame. Now this contest was not a day or like a week and it's over. It was a long process. I think it was even months or maybe even longer. So they started the process and with, with each medium, you know, it was several visits, several encounters, several seances to figure out and try to, you know, of course the goal was to try to figure out if they were fake because you know, you had half the people or more than half the people that said they were really into the spiritualism and then they'd have these seances and of course stuff would happen in these seances. And we'll talk about that. And then of course there were the skeptics like Harry Houdini. They're like, this is a bunch of a bunk. We've got to disprove this or prove it, prove it to me. I got an open mind. I mean, even then, even a Harry Houdini said, you know, he did believe in the afterlife. You know, science supports a lot of this stuff. Now, the contest is going on. And in the meantime, she is totally capitalizing on this, her initial attention, and she starts to do seances for people in town. And it started with the middle class, you know, this family, that family. And next thing you know, she's meeting with families of the upper class and the Ivy League elite. And then she gains the support of a pretty big player, Arthur Conan Doyle. Now, Arthur Conan Doyle is the one who wrote Sherlock Holmes. And he was a huge champion of spiritualism. He is right up there. And he was going to defend later if he had to lie and cheat and misrepresent. He was just, he was all in. So he liked her. He said, oh, she's the real thing. I'm going to talk about her. So, you know, Arthur Conan Doyle, we, we talked about Evangeline. All of this stuff, right? Devil in the White City, the, the, you know, the World's Fair, a lot of this, the Foreman family. I've got, you know, the trilogy, you really need to go watch that. And we've got the Harry Houdini. And this, this was like the big thing. Rich families especially were spending money to hear from their loved ones that have passed beyond the veil. So she was probably at the time in the United States it. She became mega popular. So now back to the contest. Let's get back to the contest here. It's going on, they're meeting. And it turns out that one of the employees or one of the senior people with American Scientific that was kind of dialed into the contest who was close to Harry Houdini, 
kind of gave him some inside word and he said, hey, look, this Marjorie, as she is now called, she might win this prize. Now, he was in Houdini's camp. He was a non-believer. And we know that Houdini was a, a big debunker and skeptic. And he knew all the tricks, because that's what he did. So he and other prize committee members said, all right, I'm, uh, we're, we're bringing you know, Houdini. I'm going. I want to go see this woman for myself. So he would end up going to two of her seances. And of course, where is it done? It's done over at their home, the Crandon home on Lime Street. So now it's 1924, and Houdini's kind of, you know, they're kind of deferring to him. Like, I wouldn't say he's the leader of the, the committee, but he's, he's a heavyweight. It is there that Houdini and they, they all kind of were like, there's some trickery going on here. And of course, these seances are always in the dark. So if you want to pull some magic tricks, it's pretty, pretty easy to orchestrate, right? Strings and movement, no one can see you. Just imagine what would go on behind your head if you were sitting there. Now, according to Houdini, Marjorie had secretly stretched her foot to ring a bell during the seance, and he told the committee about the fraud, and he gave them a practical demonstration. He said, yeah, this is easy. This is how you do it. Well, they weren't sure. They were kind of arguing amongst themselves. Need to do more visits. Of course, Houdini was convinced. He was out. He didn't need to see Marjorie anymore. And he would continue to basically expose her and along with the other people he thought that were involved with her as they were creating noises and pulling those parlor tricks. And he also thought that they had hidden accomplices, as I was alluding to. So in the end, in the very end before Houdini would totally stop going and conclude that it was a fake. It's like, I'll give you one more chance. I'm going to design a box. It's like a cabinet. And have you guys ever seen the, the old pictures of the people that sit in those boxes? They're steaming and only the head is sticking out. I mean, it's really funny. And it was like that, except the, you could stick your hands out the side, but like just to your wrists. So a head and two wrists. So she's like, okay. And that's one thing about her. She was very agreeable. To, she's like, Anything you ask, you know, I'll do it. Because of course, if you don't, it's like, oh, what are you doing? So she was placed in the cabinet, the box, and there was a bell that was placed on a table in front of this box, out of reach, of course, from her little hands to the side. <laughs> And they did the seance, turned the lights off, ooh. And the bell made a noise. But when the lights were turned on, guess what? It was revealed that the lid of the cabinet box had been forced open by somebody. We don't know who, uh-oh. So that was it. Houdini's like, there you go, I told you. I told you guys, this is all a fake. Now there was one guy on the committee, a secretary, Malcolm Bird, and he was working behind the scenes to kind of undermine Houdini. You know, he was a big fan and he would turn out to be an insider, a helper. So he was the secret supporter and he may have been in on the tricks but he later leaked to the press that the committee was leaning toward a positive vote that Marjorie would be the winner. Now it happened that by this time when he did that, Houdini was on a trip abroad doing his thing 
I think he was in Europe, where he was a smash. And he heard about it. They got word in. They're like, Harry, <laughs> it's, it's going down. And he got really, really mad. He's like, I've got, that, that's not going to happen on my watch. And he got back, and I guess he had to do it in person to give the thumbs down vote. In fact, what Houdini did, and he took it a lot of this personally, is he basically made, it, made her part of his stage act. He would reproduce her effects to the entertainment and applause and laughing of the audience. And if that wasn't enough, he'd publish a pamphlet that described in detail how exactly she did all these little tricks. I mean, to him, they were easy. So in the end, there was so much disagreement among the committee that there would only be one vote for her, probably by Bird, and she didn't win. And did she care? No. She was like, she already, she was getting famous. She was famous. So she continued on and expanded her operations. And it is interesting to note that as she continued her operations, she was going to do some really, really wild things. Let me just tell you. Number one, she would, they say that she would do some of these seances naked. And she would sprinkle on her breast some glowing powder. And even sometimes she would, in the dark, jump on a man's lap, one of the sitters. <laughs> That's right. She was doing all kinds of crazy things. She wore a star on her head so you could see the top of her head in the dark where she is. I don't know if that was by to prove that she wasn't floating around the room or what. And the men would look at her and the lights would come on. They were like, oh, Marjorie. They said, quote, she was too attractive for her own good. And, well, it must have been when she was younger because the picture I saw, well, anyway. So you had all of these, they were called allegations, but a good chance they happened. And then in, in the meantime with all of this, her husband, you know, the good doctor, he's taking pictures of her nude during the sessions and he's like showing people. So he's a complete perv. Later on, at some point, another type of formal evaluation was going to be done. And it was held by a committee of Harvard scholars. And it would get even more interesting now, because now with the lights turned off and the star on her forehead, the show got better. <laughs> and when I tell you some of this stuff, you're just going to be in shock. There was, a, on the table, or there was a rod. It was, it was a small rod, and they called it the ectoplasm rod. And it would move in the dark from side to side, and then it would pick up an object on its own. As it passed in front of one of the sitters, one of the observers, he couldn't help himself. He reached up and he touched it really lightly with the tip of his finger. And, as he did so, he followed it back to a point very close to Marjorie's mouth. And he thought, oh, she might be holding this thing in her teeth. So he took hold of the tip and he very quietly pinched it. He said it felt like, felt like a knitting needle, maybe covered with some soft leather. He must have had a good sense of touch. I'll tell you, if you ask me. 
no, 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 you're not supposed to touch anything. The committee had been warned by Marjorie at the very start, do not touch this thing, it could result in illness or death for me. But not surprisingly, nothing really happened to her, nor the ectoplasm rod. It didn't show any reactions to the touchings. So by the end of the sitting, one of the committee members dictated his actions to his stenographer, which was sitting there. And she also was <laughs> paying close attention. But upon hearing this, Marjorie shrieked out. She screamed, and then she suddenly fainted. She was carried out of the room, and the committee was asked to depart. We don't want you to ever come back, they were told. And they never did. And no surprise, they determined that it was all trickery. Two strikes. She's a fraud, they said. So some information that came out from them on this very interesting episode of seance this last series that hand there was a hand she had this hand that was on the table like a cutoff hand and it was referred to as teleplasmic and the teleplasmic hand was said to resemble animal tissue and a trachea cut and sewn together of course they were like what is this thing is it this is it that that's what they thought trying to figure it out and it probably was the hand did not move after its appearance on the table it would just lay there still as if it were dead and then all of a sudden it would vanish like magic now interestingly <laughs> you know we keep going in this story with this crazy stuff it was said that she refused to wear tights or hose she would not let people search her, quote unquote, internally, so you know what that means. But it was said that her husband had maybe made some alterations to her physically down there. You know where to be able to hide things in there. I mean, that's gross, I know, but I'm just telling you the story. Yes. I mean, the things were always appearing to come from her groin area, so I, that's probably where that started. I mean, good chance she just had the stuff between her legs, folded un, under her folded legs. It was also suggested that Marjorie's husband, that he may have come into the room and he was kind of like the helper. Lots of allegations, and of course the teleplasmic hand was later exposed to be a trick. They finally got some biologists in there to look at it. They made some tests like a biopsy, and I guess they found out it was made of a piece of carved animal liver. Now, where it really gets weird, and I think the weirdest for me, is is the part where she had the stuff coming out of her nose and maybe out of her ears too ectoplasm I think it was called and from one of the pictures it was like it was like an umbilical cord coming down to like a brain sitting on the I don't know sitting on the side and I guess this would happen during the, during the seance, but like, can you imagine sitting there and then you hear probably the sound like <laughs> and the lights go on and she's got this, that's probably what it was and she's got this, this thing going on. I mean, it was like ludicrous. I'm gonna put this at level ludicrous. They had a crazy device, too, to test, you know, to help 
try to determine that she wasn't doing things with her mouth and other things and she swallowed water and spit it out and it was the same amount and they had this device with tubes and everyone at the table would put it in their mouth and hold their breath I don't know and it had like little water beakers or test tubes that would show water levels breathing in and out and they said that she passed that test So again, everyone's just trying to, they want to believe, they want to believe, but they got to, they got to make sure. Now, in 1933, Walter Franklin Prince wrote an article for Scientific American, he was the author, and that was when it was claimed that J. Malcolm Byrd, that Byrd guy we talked about, intended to publish a confession in the ASPR in 1930, admitting that an act of fraud had taken place to trick Houdini in 1924. Now, whether that happened or not, I don't know, but it was all starting to break apart, but that would still not stop our friend Marjorie. She was making too much money, guys, but I think she was more into this amazing fame. Now, there would be an event in 1930 that would really be the, well, kind of the descent. The House of Cards would start to come down in a big way here. They were showing everybody these spirit thumbprints. They said, look, the, the dead have come and they've put their thumbprints on this wax. They had these like wax impressions and they had a whole bunch of them. And she was claiming that that was the materialized spirit of her dead brother, Walter Stinson, her maiden name Stinson. But people took a really close look at it, and they're like, hey, this looks like, this looks like really weird, man. I don't know. And when you look closely at them, some of them were actually duplicates, the same exact fingerprint. Okay, well, yeah. If you're using your thumb, ah, but if you look closer, they were like reverse images. Now, how could that be? Well, the spirit, I guess, could come from the other side of the veil and <laughs> leave his or her thumbprint, right? No problem. Well, people were like, come on, something's going on here. And they, then they figured out that the dentist gave those to her. And those fingerprints, they were, who, I think they were her husband's, I don't know. But those just came from the dentist. I think they might have been the dentist's fingerprints. <laughs> who knows, but that was it. That was a pivotal point. She really lost complete credibility on that one. And that would really start a, a decline. Now, things, of course, you know, started to get bad, but what really made it bad was her husband fell down the stairs in 1939, and he died. He died a little while later, and she really, you know, we talk about heartbreak. When you lose your spouse, they must have really been in love, because at that point, she just went down the tubes. Her decline was rapid and tragic. When Dr. Crandon died, she grew very melancholy. She was depressed, she turned to alcohol. And of course, her looks just really went down. In fact, the people would say she just looked like a dumpy old woman, quote unquote. She was still doing seances but it is said that during one of them, she was losing it. She actually got so distraught for some reason, she climbed to the roof of the house and she threatened to throw herself off and commit suicide. Well, Marjorie Mina Stinson Crandon died just a couple years later after her husband on November 1st, 1941. She was 53 years old. 
just barely over a month before the infamous Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, interestingly, which brought us into the U.S. into World War II. How prophetic, huh? How prophetic. And here we arrive at her grave, along with the rest of the Stinson family. You know, I wonder if Walter's on here. Yeah, I can see his name from here. So that was her brother. Walter Stinson. He is right down here. Now these are, I'm not going to be able to read these, but you guys can read it once this gets edited and produced. So I will slowly pan across. Looks like Walter Stewart Stinson. 19 something. 1911, looks like, maybe. So here, let's see if we can find Mina. Yeah, here she is, right here. Mina. Okay, so Mina looks like 1889, right? Stinson Crandon, 1941. So this is it, this is where she's at. Not with her husband who is buried. He is buried elsewhere. We did find his grave. So Marjorie is here. And maybe as we stay very still, we make find her presence nearby. Now there would be one more little twist to the story. People, of course, say that, you know, we have the debunkers, we have people that don't believe, and then of course we have the believers. And the believers all point to a story where there was two wood rings, rings made of wood like a chain, separated. One was one type of wood species and the other was another. And during the seance, they were separated. And when they turned the lights on, she had brought those, they were interlocked. Now, maybe they had another set. Maybe they stained it different, I don't know. But if that really happened, can you tell me how Houdini would have done it? Or David Copperfield? I don't know. I would love to hear in comments on that one because I can't figure it out. I didn't Google it. Anyway, to the Stinson family and to, to Mina, rest in peace.